just for a minute. I want you to imagine yourself going very, very fast through the air. You're going so fast that you feel the G-forces pushing against your skin. And you feel pressed back in your seat. Go ahead and open your eyes. Today we're going to do a very quick lesson where you are going to create a rocket. And you're going to make that straw rocket and you're going to see how far that straw rocket can go. And so on your tables, in groups of three, you guys have little baggies. And in these baggies are some straws because you are going to power your rocket with your breath. You also have a piece of paper. Mine is a very rough construction of my rocket. And you have some instructions and some standards. Okay? On your instruction packet, there's also some reflection questions. So as you are trying to design and build your rocket, think about what would be best for space travel. How am I going to design a rocket that's going to go the farthest? And uh, so when you start off, you make your rocket, make sure that you can press this in here. And I purposely designed mine very poorly so that we can have a discussion about what you could do differently. So there are targets all around the room, and you want to see how far you can get away from the target and still hit it, okay? So after you design that. So uh, mine, like I said, mine's going to be really bad. It's not going to go anywhere. So think about my very rough airplane model. How can we design that and change the design of this model to make it go and make it go far? Okay. All right. So you guys have about five minutes to do this. I will clap once, ask you if you can hear me. Clap twice, ask if you can hear me. So let's practice now so we know that you know how to get back together. Clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. And that'll be the signal for you to come back to your seat. You guys ready? All right, go. for participating with us today in our very brief STEM lesson. Of course, this is not a whole lesson. You know, you have a lot of time that you're going to be working on measuring how far away from that target your students can actually hit it. You also have those science concepts. Let's think about the design. What was wrong with it? What can you do differently? And that leads to that next step where you start talking about friction and you start talking about air resistance. And then you can build on that even further. So this lesson is designed for middle schoolers. It's designed for math, science, and you can incorporate some of those social studies considering that we were the first in flight. Um, so those were just a few of, of the things that you can do. When you have your hands on and you're involved in the problem, you also have your minds on because you are taking that, you're thinking about it, and you're trying to problem solve through it. How can I make this better? How can I beat that guy over there? Because I definitely want to. Okay? Thank you guys so much for participating with us.
Thank you, Melanie. Um, so what we're going to do um, with the rest of the hour um, is talk uh, about teaching. Um, so all of the things that you heard um, thus far this morning about our need to be globally competitive, all of it comes back to really great teachers. And tomorrow we're going to talk about Prep, or preparation, and we're going to talk about recruitment. But today, um, with some practicing teachers and instructional coaches, we're going to talk about on-the-job training. And I want to say that one of the things that uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about is what do we typically call on-the-job training in teaching? Development. Professional development. Yes, that's that's right. And and I think what we want to talk about is in juxtaposition to sort of a uh, the sort of traditional prep professional development that, that teachers receive, which is often a one-time thing where you go into the library, you get changed and tr or trained, and you go back to your classroom. We actually want to talk about um, some examples and models of coaching and really creating cultures within schools that value feedback that really helps teachers become uh, better. Um, and this is different than sort of the dialogue uh, right now, which is often you have a sort of the, the sort of accountability side of things where people think that the way that we change our school system is exclusively through measuring, and then you have on the other side the idea of autonomy for teachers. And of course there's obviously merit to both those things. I was telling Melanie, it's not like I've ever heard a teacher say, um, you know, I don't want to be held accountable. But what we really want to talk about is how do you improve your practice? And we want to talk about how um, coaching can help with that. So I am joined by, to my left, James Ford, who is the 2004 Burroughs Welcome Fund North Carolina Teacher of the Year. Um, and is, he teaches ninth grade world history at Geringer High School in Charlotte um, and has been at Charlotte Mecklenburg since 2010. Um, and secondly, I'm joined by Courtney Samuelson, um, who's an academic dean at Maureen Joy uh, Charter School in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, she works on um, English language arts and social studies, um, providing feedback on lesson plans and content execution and classroom management, and also teaches a class as well. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, and what I want to start with, I think, I guess, is I just want to give uh, Melanie a chance to talk a little bit more about, about your lesson and you know, your, you've moved fairly recently from a classroom position to a coaching position. So talk about, when you think about the lesson that you just did, talk about some of the things that you're trying to help your teachers be able to do. So a lot of the issues in education are all about how to integrate. We have so much material that we need to cover, but how do we effectively integrate it and teach it as a whole instead of, oh, here's math over here, and oh, then I go over here to science. Um, this lesson, if you saw any of the slides that were going, was done with a group of teachers and students um, to introduce them to how to teach STEM, how to go about that engineering process, how to include some technology. If we had more time, we would have some probes out and be measuring the distance that they went. Um, and so that is really the, the transition that, that we're trying to make in, in our school system is looking at the whole picture. Now how does that, how, does, how is that involved with any of what we're gonna do in the future? What does that look like in my job when I decide to pick a career? How are these skills gonna help us? And by explicitly teaching that, we really feel that students have a deeper understanding of first the content, also they're excited about learning, but they also are excited about the future and they can see where, where it's gonna connect later. So I think I kind of want to pick up on something that was said in an earlier panel about, uh, I think it was Jeff Lang talked about the fact that students aren't able to solve uh, or, or have struggle solving novel problems. Um, talk about as you, in your classroom or as you work with teachers and any of you, how, how you sort of work to help kids be able to deal with situations they haven't seen before. I guess I can go first. Um. I think the first thing is you have to take the fear out of it. Uh, we've taught kids so often that, or kids have been used to this algorithm, right, of how you solve problems, right? The school is kind of a puzzle, and you just get the cheat codes, and what's the answer? 
don't be scared to fail, okay? This is, we don't necessarily know what the outcome is, but there, there should be an envir environment that encourages risk taking, right? These are the rules, the general guidelines. I will help facilitate through that process, but understand the journey is really what the learning process is. It's, it's the pathway to discovering the end outcome and whether that goal is necessarily achievable or not, that experience of trying to work through, problem solve, you know, trial and error, those are the sorts of things that are the most, uh, the most ripe opportunities for learning. So getting kids to understand what is your target here? The target is understanding the process of learning, learning how to learn, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Courtney, what do you think about that? Um, I'm think I don't know if my- You're on now. Okay. Um, one of our school characteristics is curiosity. Um, and we place curiosity just as high as we do achievement um, or working hard or bravery in the classroom. And so when we celebrate curiosity in our students, sometimes we even celebrate, you know, those kind of failures and working through problems. So it's exactly what James shared. It's getting comfortable with our fear. Um, I told our art teacher to make a poster called The Eraser Is My Friend because our kids just, they want to do everything right the first time. They're so afraid to make mistakes and to erase. Um, we want kids to embrace, you know, that, that failure, that trial and error. So curiosity for us is huge. So I think you know one of the things we want to talk about today is is in how you improve practice, right? Um, and so I mean I'd start with you, James. But if you think about um, how professional development has been traditionally done, could you talk a little bit about that, and then talk about what um, what more job embedded and coaching based um, professional development would look like? Well, I think you somewhat spelled it out at the at the outset when you said that. Um, Weekly, you may have a meeting, uh, a staff meeting, typically on a Wednesday after school, right, when everybody's done teaching a full load and you're just trying to get over the hump. You come up to the media center uh, and you may have a quick staff meeting, talk about some issues, and then there's professional development PD, where somebody usually stands up in front of you, talks to you about some concept, and you're supposed to go out and put that into practice. And so it, the very idea of being interactive and engaging is not even demonstrated in the implementation of professional development. And so it oftentimes doesn't penetrate for teachers the same way that, that technique doesn't penetrate for kids. Uh, so what has been most, uh, what's been great for me is having somebody there to mentor you much like what I'm sure uh, she does, which is kind of overseeing and observing you and, and giving you some harsh and constructive criticism and learning how to gather from that. The encouragement of risk taking, uh, and then having somebody come in and actually facilitate what you did right here. Most of the individuals, when asked later on today, what did you guys do at the retreat? They can, ex they can explain at least probably with 80% proficiency what took place today. Being able to be engaged in that process versus a top-down approach of just sitting in front of somebody lecturing uh, resonates a whole lot better. So those are the things that work for kids. They also work for adults as well. Yeah. You guys have other thoughts on that? I, I think that we have to take that. Uh, we you said it when you said the risk taking. Uh, we have to take that away and, and let teachers make mistakes too. Um, they're going to, they wanna try new things, but they're afraid. So they'll call me and say, hey, like I saw this idea. Do you think you could, do you think I could do that? I'm like, yeah, do you want me to come in and model that for you? We'll try it, I've never done it, but we can do it together. And taking that fear away, not only from our students, but also from our teachers, we are, in a period of time, I think that we have to innovate in our classrooms. We, as teachers, have to be innovators so that our students will be able to innovate. So I wanna pick up on one thing you said, which I think is pretty powerful, and I think it kind of relates to Courtney as well, because Courtney is both an instructional coach as well as has a, a, at least one class. Um, talk a little bit about modeling and why why, as an instructional coach, it would be really important and give you credibility to go in in front of a bunch of kids and, and model what a good lesson looks like? Yeah, um, I recently just had a lot of success um, modeling a lesson with one of my teachers. Um, she's a first year teacher. She has really, really struggled. Um, and it, it kind of took a lot of struggling to get to the point where I realized I need to teach a lesson in, to her kids and I, I want her to watch me teach it. It was Spanish. I've never taught Spanish before. Um, but I, I taught the 45 minute lesson and um, it wasn't perfect. It made me realize what kind of point of feedback I needed to give her. Um, but our relationship has just grown so much since then and her teaching has improved so, so much since then. She was able to see 
kind of, oh, this is what Courtney keeps telling me to do. Now I understand. Now I can see it. Um, and then, like I said, it made me a better coach because I was able to see, okay, this is what it takes um, to teach Spanish. And I, I wanted to piggyback off of what you guys said. If you contrast kind of the way Melanie and I are coaching teachers versus how about half of North Carolina still is kind of evaluating teachers, which is the schools who don't have these teacher coaching models. Generally, it looks like your principal comes in um, two, two times a year, evaluates you. To be honest, that lesson that you teach the day your principal comes in, it's probably the best lesson you've ever taught. You've got everything perfect. You know your principal's coming. Um, and just think about how damaging that actually is for kids, that when you're being evaluated, it's your best lesson ever, and it might not be representative of the way that you actually teach. So Melanie and I are in classrooms every single week. Um, I'm seeing my teachers every week. It's actually a lot more beneficial for kids if your lesson completely flops right in front of me, because then I can coach you talk to you about what failed, talk you through that, um, and just kind of that trust like that you have people calling you, will you help me with this, will you model this for me, that is way more beneficial for our kids learning versus I'm going to teach one awesome lesson when my principal comes in. So I think underlying that is, is a, an issue of the culture in the school building, right? It's an issue yeah. of um, how do we create environments in every school where the classroom is where classroom is open and you observe other people and you are observed regularly and get feedback, what do you feel like is key to creating cultural change in the schools that you're at and, and in ed any school in North Carolina? I think it starts with leadership. Uh, who, whoever your administrator is, your admin team, they have to be bought into that concept uh, that you're going to change the culture and it's going to be done from a hands-on approach, right? Not from a top-down approach. Um, additionally, I think it would be preferable if there were some benchmarks in place to ensure that those leaders are master teachers right. because you can't leave where you can't go. Right. So if, you, if you're not, if you haven't demonstrated in your own career, right, that you know how to implement these things and that you know how to build relationships with kids, how to get uh, growth, how to get achievement, the expectation that you'll lead others into that territory is I feel somewhat flawed, but it takes forward thinking, uh, inventive and uh, collaborative style leadership in order to make that happen. Yeah, I think I mean I think that's one of the things that's interesting about you know the model that Courtney is talking about is you you at least have some credibility because you have a set of kids every day and you were not were talking about that as teacher of the year you're out of the classroom and it's like you, you spend all this time and you're no longer grounded in day to day instruction with kids. Um, so one of the things that I think is important that I think a lot of schools in North Carolina are are really trying to do. Um, you know, education has tons of acronyms. So one of the acronyms is a PLC, which is a professional learning community. Um, and this is a pretty important concept that I think is in pretty much most schools. Can one of you just describe uh, briefly what a professional learning community is and what the goal of that is in terms of helping improve practice? There's lots of different types of professional communities. Um, some, some of your professional learning communities are based on their content. So you would have your eighth grade science team get together every week to talk about, okay, here's our lesson. Here's what went really, really well this week for me. What went really well for you? What did the kids get? What did they struggle with? And kind of just problem solving within that small group about how we can best serve our students and how we can move forward. So if there's something that my students didn't get that Courtney's students did, I would gather her strategies and try that again in my classroom, hopefully with some success. Um, and then if it flops, then you know we would sit down together and kind of talk. Our vision is really um, that lesson study model um, that is very popular um, in, in some places where those classrooms are open. So Courtney would say, why don't you just come and, and watch my class and we'll find you some coverage. And so I would go and watch her class and see what she was doing. She's in practice, she's doing what I do and, and I'm gonna learn from her and take that. Um, but then we would have a, a conversation. You know, Courtney would be open to that feedback and, and then she would come in my classroom and I would be open to her feedback so that we can grow together as we move forward. Um, I have one more question, but with the time we have remaining, I want to make sure that if you all have any questions, that you please raise your hand. And the, the last question, so get those ready. I'll, the last one I'll ask is, um, 
uh, Jeff Lang from MetLife said they hire for 50% behavior. <laughs> so one of the things I want to talk about is behavior management and classroom management and the degree to which that is your experiences in coaching people to improve in that, I think it doesn't get talked about as much as um, some other things. So I'd just be interested in your reflections on that. <laughs> it's I mean, making everybody I, smile. Uh, the classroom management, I just, I can't stress how important it is. You cannot do anything as a teacher, I truly believe, if you cannot manage your class. Um, our school really focuses on bite-sized classroom management tips, as simple as when you ask the kids to do something, do you actually look around to make sure that they did it? Um, teaching them those little tiny bite-sized things, um, I just, I, I don't want to go as far as to say it's the number one thing, but you really can't do much else <laughs> if you can't manage right. your class. I agree. I think those things have to be explicitly taught to teachers because they, they not, they don't always know um, what to do. You pretty much go through this program and then you are in with a, you know, a teacher for maybe six weeks and then boom, you're in front of 30 kids and the door's shut and you're like, oh, what am I going to do now? So, you know, I think that we have to explicitly teach our teachers what classroom management looks like, what good classroom management looks like, but still being able to give students the freedom and some inquiry-based abilities that they need as well. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think it should be a requisite part, not just of the programs, which most of them are, but it should be a requisite part of your first couple of years there. I mean, when you get deployed into that classroom, so to speak, there should be somebody there to help you learn how to manage all those personalities and all those needs in that room. As I mentioned before, there's nothing, there's no sorts of, sort of instruction that can take place if you can't make that environment safe, if you can't make it a, a teachable, teachable environment. And there's things you're gonna encounter that, let me tell you, there's a difference between theory and practice, mm -hmm. right? You, there's days you're like, okay, they didn't tell me about yep. this uh, in class. <laughs> right. What do right. I do here? And so you need other teachers there, you need other folks to kind of tell you, look, this is how I would handle this. And then after a while, you begin to develop your style, but it takes time to get that. Yeah, and I think this is a really important discussion as we think about what we'll hear about tomorrow, about um, teacher preparation and some of the work that's being done there, and uh, the major emphasis that, uh, of a lot of work on practicum, on really expanding the, the, in training, expanding the amount of time you spend in front of students to sort of learn those things before you're in your first year of teaching all alone and the stakes are high. I want to thank our panel um, for its splendid work. You guys are great. These are North Carolina teachers. We've got an awful lot to be proud of in, in these young people. I do want to take just a moment to ask June Atkinson because what you've said about PD is absolutely correct. I mean, it's it's still the way we did it when I was a principal, which was three years ago. Um, but I'm going to, uh, the DPI has done a great job of helping superintendents and principals understand what constitutes good professional development and how good coaching will happen. I just want to give June a second to talk about home base and where all that is located. Uh, take the comments that I'm about ready to make. Uh, against the backdrop of what Representative Cotham has talked about professional development and what our teachers have said. You heard this morning the notion that we should personalize learning for every child. Well, our push is to personalize learning for every teacher in the state. Yeah. And in order to personalize uh, learning for every teacher in the state, you must have resources. And a part of those resources uh, includes what we have in home base as online modules that can be used in a coaching situation or after a coaching situation. It can be used with the principal to help a teacher to improve. And one of the strategies we have, uh, we have used is that we have over 430 teachers in the state who have been working since last summer to develop materials that are pertinent to other teachers, and by the end of April of this year, we will have populated more and more of home base to have those resources. So when, for example, uh, Mr. Ford wants to coach a teacher in social studies, and if that's his responsibility, 
and he sees that the teacher is struggling with classroom management, then because of the way it's tagged, he can go and say, maybe you would like to watch this video, and then let's come back and have a discussion. And so it allows teachers to have resources at their fingertips. And we've only just begun because we know that it takes a lot of work to personalize learning for every teacher in the state. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.